Okay, how's everybody doing? You're not asleep? No, okay. General P, thanks for being our host, and uh, thank you for your leadership. Listen, as I told you this morning, this is a great day for you. You get to hear from our 38th Chief of Staff of the entire Army. I won't read you his bio. You've got it. You've, you know who he is. Just let me add a personal comment. I've known General Odierno since he was a young brigade commander. I've known him as a family man, as a soldier, and as a leader. He's commanded in combat at the division level, at the corps level, and at the multinational force Iraq level. He's the guy who orchestrated the surge in Iraq. He's been deployed longer than any of our general officers, and he's also been a combatant commander. And you are all extremely lucky. One, that he's your chief of staff during this tough time for our country as we reshape and re-identify where it is we're going to go with our national interest, but also a man who understands from the family's point of view, from soldiers' point of view, where he needs to take this Army that he has served so well. So with that, let's give a great welcome to our 38th Chief of Staff of the Army. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, good evening. It's, it's great to be back here. And I was, I enjoyed getting, to at least get to shake each one, almost I think everybody's hand tonight, and I appreciated that very much. And the one thing that was clear to me, which is important to us, is the diversity of the group. Uh, from all different parts of the country, uh, many different institutions, uh, all coming together for a common goal, for a common theme, and that's to serve our country. And for me, there's nothing more important than that. Joe Cody, thank, thank you so much. The 31st Vice Chief of Staff, a good friend of mine, and I really do appreciate that kind introduction. But more importantly, I, I appreciate what you do in your own personal time to continue to build leaders and the time you take to spend with them. So thank you, sir, for doing that. General P, uh, the superintendent of VMI, uh, for the last 11 years, it's always great to spend time with you, sir. Uh, as always, uh, VMI looks great. I want to thank you for your dedication, not only to this institution, but our future leaders. And it's always great to be with a fellow artilleryman. General Combs, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, just moving into the job, you're very fortunate to have General Combs leading Cadet Command, uh, a dedicated, articulate, brilliant, smart leader who will continue to lead our ROTC program and Cadet Command into the future, and that's very important. So, uh, Peggy, thank you for being here and everything that you're doing. I think you know as you sit here and you see the name of this series, obviously VM, VMI produced one of the greatest leader, in my opinion, and in most people's opinion, the nation has ever known. The General of the Army, George C. Marshall. You know, I have the honor as a 38th Chief of Staff of the Army to sit at the same desk as all the Chiefs before me, including General Marshall, who is the 15th Chief of Staff. I also get to live in the same house that General Marshall lived in. The Chief of Staff of the House Quarters 1 at Fort Myers was built in 1899, and every Chief of Staff since 1908 has had the opportunity to live there. From John J. Pershing, to Douglas MacArthur, to Dwight D. Eisenhower, to George C. Marshall, to Omar Bradley, to many, many others. And the pictures are on the wall, so every morning as I walk out, I get counseling statements from every one of them <laughs> to make sure that uh, I'm directing and leading the Army in the right way. You know, as Chief of Staff, I've been in the Army for 38 years. I'm getting ready to end my time in the Army. But the reason I've stayed in the Army for 38 years is because of people like you. Young men and women who are vibrant, who want to learn, who are looking forward to the future. And you all have a full head of hair. You know, General Marshall had an interesting path to the Army. In 1901, 
ROTC did not exist. VMI graduates had to apply to the War Department in order to come into the Army to gain authorization. So all Mr. Marshall needed was a letter from President McKinley. So as an adaptive, innovative young leader, Cadet Marshall thought this, thought this as an opening rather than an obstacle. So one day he went to the White House without an appointment, somehow finagled his way up to the President's office, got in to see the President who asked him what he wanted, Marshall stated his business and soon gained his, gained his letter of commission from the President of the United States. We are grateful for General Marshall for helping to pave the way for ROTC and to become a permanent Army commissioning source since 1916. We are indebted to him for his leadership, his vision, his courage, commitment. Most of you should be glad that because of him, they tightened up security around the White House. <laughs> this is the 37th Marshall ROTC Awards and the Leadership Seminar, and I hope you all taken advantage of it. I had a chance to talk to many of you about what you did today, and it's clear to me that you are. And while you continue to attend and participate in these roundtables on all the current global threats and some of the new issues facing the Army, such as cybersecurity, learning about our missions in Afghanistan and Korea, learning about Pakistan, learning about a rising China. These are all the kind of things that you'll be dealing with for the next, hopefully, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. This is what it is to enter the profession of arms. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But don't ever forget, the Army is about soldiers. The Army is first and foremost about soldiers and the relationships that you build. And you start that here. My guess is many of you will run into each other again somewhere along the line. Maybe in a year, maybe in five, maybe in ten. I graduated from West Point 38 years ago, almost 38 years ago in June. And I was where you are now, a senior year cadet surrounded by a great amount of young leaders. Our army was starting to draw down after a war, Vietnam. Military priorities were changing. Military priorities were a little bit different. different. People predicted back then that we would never go to war again. I'll say that again. People predicted back then and said we will never go to war again. Some of us felt we were coming late to the fight. Some of us felt we wouldn't have the experience of those who we were good about ready to lead. Does that sound familiar? So there's many people who've walked in your shoes. So it's not about that. It's about what you do to learn to be a leader. You think you might have missed out on a generations of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Perhaps you're worried you won't have the opportunity to lead soldiers in combat. But as General Marshall said, if man does find the solution for world peace, it will be the most revolutionary reversal of his record we have ever known. I do not know where the next wars will be fought, but I do know that leading soldiers during a time of war is highly likely. That was General Marshall. I say the same words to you. The opportunity to lead soldiers in a conflict somewhere around the world is highly likely. You are entering the Army at a time in which the security environment is more uncertain than I've ever seen it in my 38 years. All you have to do is read the papers every day. 60 days ago, nobody was talking about Crimea. In fact, most people didn't know where Crimea was. We simply don't know. We continue to see aggressive behavior by North Korea. We see turmoil across the Middle East. 
We see terrorist elements attempting to establish themselves in North and Central Africa. So we're going to have to continue to guard against these threats. We will be asked to prevent conflict. You prevent conflict by building, by building capacity and sustaining a high level of capability. We'll be asked to shape future environments, shape the theater in the Pacific region as we try to balance the power in the Asia Pacific region. We'll be asked to shape the Middle East. It looks like we're going to be asked to begin to shape Eastern Europe potentially in the future. We're going to be asked to shape North and Central Africa. You are going to get the opportunity to do that. You will have an opportunity to lead under very complex, difficult conditions. In fact, I would tell you this is the most complex I've ever seen it, and the world is becoming more complex. It's becoming more interwoven. It's becoming more complex and complicated because of the way we move information at the speed of Twitter. What do I think that means for the future? I believe that means that decision making is going to become more and more decentralized. We'll be doing things in smaller entities, smaller units. So what does that require? That requires young leaders who are going to have to be prepared to make decisions. It's up to us to help prepare you. It's seminars like this. It's our institutional training. It's our operational training that will help you to prepare to understand the type of things that you're going to have to deal with. I will tell you right now, you are much better prepared than I was when I was a senior in college at West Point. You might not think you are, but you are. You are better prepared. But the most important thing is you can't just rest on that. You must understand that you must continue to learn, continue to adapt, continue to understand the environment around you, assess what that environment means, and then build the skills that are necessary for you to continue to lead. As you get ready to lead soldiers, I want you to think about the Army profession. What does it mean to live Army values? To be the ethical examples of others. Leadership, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. All of these are the pillars upon which you must stand. You must internalize them to yourselves. You must demonstrate unquestionable character and remain truthful in word and deed. The young men and women that you're about to lead represent the best qualities of our nation. Mental and physical toughness, courage, teamwork, selflessness. And remember, that America's fathers and mothers are going to give you their most precious resource, their sons and daughters. And it's our responsibility to lead them. It's our responsibility to make sure they are prepared. It is our responsibility to make sure that we're able to sustain this nation's security. And in my mind, there's no greater profession than ours. As General Omar Bradley once noted, leadership is intangible and therefore no weapon can replace it. This is about preparing leaders to do the things necessary to accomplish very difficult missions. It is about earning respect. It is about fostering positive command climates to help individuals grow and contribute to unit success. 
Leadership is today and will remain paramount to our profession. Being a leader is not about giving orders. You must earn the trust of your soldiers. You must earn their respect. I'm just going to put one slide up here and I just want to talk about it for a minute. If you can put it up, please. On the slide here, pictured, are nine individuals who I believe represent what leadership is about. They are nine Medal of Honor winners from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. There will be a 10th Medal of Honor awarded on the 14th of May to another great soldier. There will be an 11th Medal of Honor awarded in July. Eleven individuals who taught us all about commitment, competence, and character. And I want to spend the last few minutes talking to you about that this evening before I open it up for questions. There are four things that I talk about when I talk about basic leadership. The first is trust. We are given an inherent responsibility when you raise your right hand and swear to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We are the only profession where you are asked potentially to take another person's life to accomplish your mission. That's pretty weighty if you really think about it. And in order to do that, and in the situations you'll be placed, especially as Army officers, it's important that you understand the, the paramount importance of trust. Trust between each other. The inherent trust that people know you will be there, that you'll know your job, that you'll have each other's backs. The trust that you have to have between your soldiers and leaders. They have to have trust that you'll make a tough decision. They have to have trust that you're going to constantly learn, that you will be able to lead them in the most difficult times. They have to believe in you as a person. And then we have to have trust between our leaders and the Army. We have to have that right trust to make sure we continue to give you the capability and resources to do your job, to allow you to grow, to allow you to lead. And most importantly, we must have trust between the Army and the American people. Any survey that you see today the military is rated higher than any other profession. But that could go away very quickly. And it's important that every one of us, from four-star general to cadet or second lieutenant, understand the importance of our profession. It's our responsibility to sustain our profession together. So let me talk about what I think is important in the profession. It's those three words, the three C's. First being competence. Nobody starts out competent. We all have to learn. But it's about first, no matter what branch you are, first, competence is defined by the basic fundamentals of your specific branch. Understanding what it's like if you're a logistician. Understanding what you have to do to lead an infantry squad. Understanding what you have to do to lead an artillery section. Understand what you have to do as an aviation platoon leader. You've got to be able to fly that helicopter as good as anyone else. You've got to be able to navigate your, your squad anywhere in the world. You've got to be competent in your weapons. That's what leaders do. It's about competence. But you don't, you have, to con you have to keep increasing your competence because as you sustain yourself in the Army, you're going to give yourself times of increasing responsibility. So you have to constantly learn. You have to constantly adjust. You have to learn the next important task, whether it be where you're going to deploy. You have to maintain your phys fitness. Lead from the front. Lead by example. Competence. 
That's what soldiers want. They want you to set standards. They don't want you to be their friends. They can get friends anywhere. Leading is not being friends. Leading is about establishing standards and forcing standards and doing it in a fair way. Treating people with dignity and respect. Understanding what's important about your job. Being excited about having a passion for what you do. That's competence. The second C is commitment. Committed to your unit. Committed to the mission. Committed to the institution. And sometimes I've seen them, like, can we get that confused a little bit? I see where somebody gets in their squad or platoon or their company or their battalion, and they get so committed to each other, they lose sight of what's right and what's wrong. And what that means is they've lost their commitment to the institution. They've lost their commitment to the institution. Character. Character is what's defined you. That's who you are. That's who you are. And people define character in many different ways. Some people say it's doing the right thing when nobody's watching. Some people say it's having the right moral and ethical values. Some people say it's all of that stuff. But character is who you are. How many people saw the, the movie Lone Survivor? So what do you think about that dilemma, that ethical dilemma that they faced? Now that's a big one. Peep, that's an easy one. That's a big ethical dilemma. But here's what I'm going to tell you happens. And this is going to be the hardest thing that you have to face as a second lieutenant. Is you're going to face some minor dilemma when you have to make a tough decision. And it could be as simple as um, it could be as simple as somebody you know, being told to do a pretty important mission. Let's say uh, you're, you're supposed to uh, prepare uh, a bunch of vehicles to go meet some commitment somewhere, and you don't do it. Your platoon doesn't do it. And somebody comes and tells you, okay, if you don't say this, you're going to get in trouble. Tell them you did it, even though you know you didn't. What are you going to do? It's easy sitting here in an auditorium. It's harder when your soldiers are looking at you. But once you start going down that road of making the wrong decision, first off, you don't know. Then you make another decision. And then your soldiers start saying, okay, here's my leader. They're going to make decisions to save their ass. They're not going to make a decision because it's the right thing to do. And then your squad starts going, your platoon starts going, and your company starts going. And then all of a sudden, when it's really important, you're so used to making the wrong decision because it's easier, then we make a decision that costs lives. Then we make an ethical decision that has an impact on your unit, the Army, and the mission. That's the hardest thing for young officers, is what you do when you face this ethical dilemma. We've all done it. And sometimes we've made the wrong choice. If you do, it's important to understand that and make sure it doesn't happen again. Because we have this great responsibility that we've been given to lead the most precious resources our nation has, our sons and daughters. How about when you're a platoon leader and you get a report that your platoon sergeant sexually assaulted a female. And you're afraid, and you're afraid to face that. And so you wipe it under the rug and say, oh no, it didn't, I'm not gonna report that. The victim is, is telling a story, it's not true. You've started to go down that path. Your responsibility is to report everything. 
responsibilities to report any incident of misconduct and let it be properly investigated so they can determine whether it happened or not. And then the next ethical dilemma is when you do that, it's your platoon sergeant, then you got the second platoon sergeant come to see you and say, sir, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? That's my best friend. He, he's been deployed four times. He's a great warrior. What are you doing to him? That's why it's a tough decision. But it's the right one. You're going to face that. Every one of you are going to face something what I just described there. That's what character is about. The biggest problem we have, the most dangerous kind of leader is the one I just described. He's incredibly competent. He's the best platoon sergeant. He's been deployed four times. He's won two medals of valor. He, he knows how to do this better than everybody else. But now he's doing some other things. He's abusing people. And so what do you do? The most dangerous leader we, we have are competent leaders who lack character. Because they can, they can affect the whole unit. So that's the dilemma. That's what leadership is about. Those tough decisions that you have to make. Now I'm hoping none of you ever have to do that. I hope you don't get put in that situation. But remember what we do is really important. And you never know when you get to deploy with that group of men and women and what you might ask to be, what, what you might ask to be, uh, might ask to do if you deploy with them. So in my mind, leadership is about four basic things. Building trust, leading by example, showing competence in everything you do, being committed to what you're doing, having a passion for everything that you do, and doing it with character. If you do that stuff, you'll be a great leader. You'll be incredibly successful no matter what you decide to do in life. But I know you'll be successful in the Army. Let me take a few minutes just to talk a little about your Army today that you're getting ready to go into, many of you. Most people think, well, you know, we're out of Iraq, we're out of Afghanistan, there's not much going on. As I stand here today, there are 75,000 soldiers deployed. We have soldiers deployed to Afghanistan, we have soldiers deployed to Jordan, we have soldiers deployed to Turkey, I have soldiers deployed to Gutter, soldiers deployed to Kuwait, soldiers deployed to Libya, all over the world deployed. We have another 85,000 soldiers forward stationed, 150 countries. We're in a dynamic time with a dynamic army. Yes, we're in the process of downsizing our army. But today we're about 520,000, down from a high of 570. We'll be at 490, 490,000 in the active component by the end of 15. We'll do that while we remain committed with all those people I just told you. And as we continue to build and train, and develop readiness. There's three things that I'm responsible for as the chief right now. One is to make sure we, we sustain all our commitments and meet them with trained and ready soldiers. Second is to make sure we downsize in such a way where we're able to meet those commitments and take care of our soldiers. And third, we've got to look to the future. What do we want this army to be in 10 years? 15 years, 20 years. As warfare continues to adjust and change, the world continues to adjust and change. How do we get the right training, concepts, equipment, in order to make sure we're prepared? That's exciting to me. We have some new concepts like regionally aligned forces. We're going to align units, divisions, brigades, battalions, companies to different parts of the world. Right now, we have about 2,000 soldiers from a regional line brigade in Africa. They've done about 80 to 90 separate missions in the last year. We have a brigade regionally aligned and all its supporting structure, combat service support, combat support aligned to the NATO response force, which is pretty important, pretty damn important now when you think about the Ukraine and the Crimea. They just finished training. They're going to deploy over to Europe on a training exercise in the next month or so. We just did a joint airborne operation into Thailand with the Thai Army. We just did a joint 
humanitarian assistance mission with the Chinese in Hawaii. We continue to have soldiers conducting training and advise missions in Afghanistan. We're getting ready to train the Libyan army, and we could do that in Bulgaria. Probably the next month or so, they're going to have to start training Syrian army in Jordan. There's a lot going on. And oh, by the way, we have over 20,000 soldiers on the Korean Peninsula. Every single day to the demilitarized zone up to the north, working with our South Korean partners to be ready to go. We have an incredibly talented army. In the last Olympics, the army got five medals in the last Winter Olympics. Soldiers in the army learned, earned five medals. Incredibly talented army we have across the board. It's an organization you want to be part of. It's an organization I've been proud to be part of for a very long time. So be excited about it. We have great leaders out there willing to help you as you get out there. We have great non-commissioned officers who are willing to put their arms around you when you first come to your unit. Take advantage of it. This is a great army. You're going to add to that great army. Your dedication, your leadership will add to the army. I leave you with one last thought. Is as you come in the army, the most important thing that I did and I remember when I was young and your age is I had fun. Is I loved what I did. I worked as hard as I could, and I had as much fun as I could. Because this is a fun thing to do. There's nothing like interacting with people from all walks of life in many difficult situations. I have lifetime friends that I might see once every 10 years, but when I see them, it's like I, I, I met them yesterday. Because we shared experiences that are unlike any others. That's what you're going to find the armies about. You will never forget those experiences. You will never forget those people you met because you sacrificed together and you achieved something together. That's what we're about. So congratulations to all of you for being here because I know that your leaders and your exceptional leaders or you wouldn't be here. That's why you're selected. So congratulations to all of you. It's clear that you have the competence, commitment, and character. It's now you get to build on it as you go forward. So I always end by saying the strength of our nation is our army. The strength of our army is our soldiers. The strength of our soldiers is our families. And that's what makes this army strong. So let me stop there and let me open it up for questions.